Every letter with that, uh, the Christian writer A.W. Tozer, some of you know, you have some of his writings, that uh, Tozer, to paraphrase him, Tozer said, grace is God's goodness or favor or blessing given to those who don't deserve it. Let me say it one more time. It's God's goodness or favor or blessing given to those who don't deserve it. And when we understand grace in this way, then we can understand why grace is the gift that we need. Uh, John, when he was writing the Gospel of John, this is John the Beloved, said in John, uh, this is in verse 16 and 17 of 1, this is not in your notes if you're one of the, uh, if you're with the Chinese group, from his abundance, this is from God's abundance, God has so much, right? God has so much, and John wrote, from his abundance we have all received grace upon grace, or grace after grace after grace. For although the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know, people look at our shortcomings, people look at our weaknesses, people look at our inabilities, and it's very, very easy to point a finger, it's very easy to criticize. All of us probably do it, and all of us have been at the receiving end, and all of us have heard the voice inside, can't you do better? Why can't you do better? Why are you like this? Or am I the only one that has heard that voice? Have you heard that voice before? We've all heard that voice. And a lot of times we think that's our voice. And a lot of times we think that's God's voice, don't we? How many of you have ever thought that's, that's what God is saying to you? You blew it again. Can't you do better? I'm disappointed in you. Why can't you do better? Can't you, can't you change this? And the simple answer to all of those questions and accusations is, no, I can't. You and I can't do better on our own. We can't. You and I can't change on our own. We can't. And so that voice that we hear, and that voice that we think it's our voice, it's actually the devil's voice. It's certainly not God's voice. And the problem a lot of times is you and I, instead of agreeing with God, we agree with the enemy. Did you know that? A lot of times we agree with the enemy's voice inside. inside. And so I want to talk about the gift of grace today. It's the gift that we need. And I especially want to talk about this because some of us are getting ready to make New Year's resolutions. Have any of you already made some New Year's resolutions? Anybody? None? Well, I don't know if that means you're completely unmotivated or if it means you've really got this whole grace thing uh, squared away and you know what it means. Do any of you plan to make some New Year's resolutions before the first? No? Well, you are a bunch of unmotivated people. <laughs> now you can say, you can return to me right now and say, that's condemnation, Pastor Jennifer. That's not from God. You're right. Um, for me, I hope to make some New Year's resolutions, um, but I'm going to make them in light of this message today. Do you know what uh, they have shown? Uh, research has shown uh, that only 8% of all New Year's resolutions are completed, are carried out, are successful. Can you imagine that? 8%, 92% fail rate. How about that? It's not very encouraging, is it? 92%. Uh, most of our res resolutions, even as Christians, most of our resolutions have to do with health. Diet, exercise, I'm going, all of these things, right? Okay, some of us are saying, yeah, 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 and you're already feeling condemned. <laughs> If you feel condemned after this message on grace, then you've been listening to the wrong thing, because we're not going to talk about condemnation today. Um, the gift of grace takes care of condemnation, takes care of criticism, takes care of weaknesses, takes care of all of these things. And um, so we're going to talk about this gift of grace that God gives us, because every one of us has blown it in this past year. Every one of us. Your pastors have. You ha we know you have, and you know we have, right? We all know each other really well. We've all blown it. We've all, none of us uh, deserves it. None of us is perfect. And um, the great thing about it is that when God gives us this gift, 
We can't earn it, because if we earned it, it wouldn't be grace. If we deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. If we could work for it, it wouldn't be grace. Grace is the gift that God gives us, and we don't deserve it. I am so thankful for that, because I know I deserve something a lot worse. I deserve criticism. I know I'm not perfect. I deserve, I feel like I deserve condemnation because I've blown it. And you may feel that way as well. But God comes to us and he says, I give you the gift of grace. I give you the gift of grace. So let's see how this works in our situations and in our lives. And we don't get what we deserve. That's mercy. Did you know that that's, a, that's an informal definition of mercy? Mercy is not getting what we deserve. We deserve punishment, we deserve judgment, we deserve criticism, we deserve all of these things, but we don't get that. That's mercy. We get something good from God instead, and that's grace. So those are the two that fit together. Does that make sense? Mercy, we don't get what we do deserve. Grace, we get what we don't deserve. So, as we get into it, I want to read to you one of the most terrifying verses in the Bible. It's not about hell. It's not about the tribulation. Let me read to you this verse. I don't know about you. You may not have thought about it before, but this is one of the most frightening verses in the Bible. Look with me. Hebrews 4.13. The writer says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. <laughs> Do you mean that those things that you thought, that you did this year, that you thought nobody knows, God knows? Yep. Do you mean the things that you thought, and you thought, I can't believe I thought that. God knows? Yep. The things that you hoped were hidden from everybody because you were so ashamed of them. God sees them? Yep. Not only that, Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a terrifying verse. Is it to you or is it just to me? If I look at this, it's terrifying. Not only does God know everything about my life, I have to give an account to him for every one of those things. I have to answer to him. I don't have to answer to you. I can hide it from you, but I can't hide it from God. And I have to give an answer to God about it. And he sees it all. Now, what happens when we see this verse? What's our natural reaction? Our natural reaction is just to run as fast as we can go in the other direction, right? Our natural reaction is to hide whatever we can. Those of you parents, you have kids. Uh, let me ask you this. Your kid has done something wrong. Your child has done something wrong. How many of you, your child's first response is to come to you come as soon as they've done something wrong? whether accidentally or on purpose, they come running to you and they say, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, I did something wrong. Is that, is that, the, uh, is that what children do? Most of the time, they go running in the other direction. Most of the time, they try to hide it. Most of the time, they try to <laughs> blame somebody else. You know why I can say that? Look at Adam and Eve because we are the descendants of Adam and Eve, aren't we? They blew it, they messed up. What's the first thing they did? They ran away and they hid, right? What's the second thing they did? It was her fault. <laughs> they blamed somebody else. And so we look at this verse, and so I don't know about you, I look at this and I don't see a lot of grace in this verse, do you? But look at the verses that come after this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And so as we look at this, this gives us a picture of grace. Most of us know verses 14 and 15 very well. We're familiar with verses 14 and 15, aren't we? We know this one. But how many of us put together 
verse 13 with it. We don't usually, do we? But it's a whole passage together. And then look at the part that comes after it. Verse 16 says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence or boldly. Do you know what this word actually means? The literal meaning of this word? It means to come honestly. So we're not covering up. We're not hiding. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so when I see this and when we put this together, here's the picture of grace. You and I, because of our bent, because of our human nature, the bend, we run from, we hide, we excuse, and we blame, don't we? we that's, that's human nature. And God, because He knows what we're like, and because Jesus came and walked in your shoes, every one of our shoes, He walked in those shoes, Jesus says, I understand you. You see, sometimes people, other people look at us and all they see, let me just speak really frankly this morning. This is a simple message. I just want to speak, really want to speak from the heart. Sometimes people look at us and our shortcomings and our wrongdoings and they say to us or they say about us, why do you do that? Why can't you be better? What Jesus does is he says, I understand what you've done. I understand why you've done what you've done. I know that you came from a family that was hard and unloving. I know that you come from a family with an absentee father or an absentee mother, and that bent you in a certain way. I know that things were done to you as a child that should not be done to any child, and it shaped you in a particular way. You see, Jesus understands the motivations and the heart, and he understands the why. And because he understands the why, and because he knows our weakness, Instead of Jesus saying, I'm perfect, why aren't you perfect? Instead, Jesus gets down on one knee and holds his arms open wide and he says, come to me. Let me give you the grace that you need for this situation. Does that make sense? I'm just being, I'm speaking really practically with you this morning, really openly and honestly with you. Jesus knows our weaknesses and he knows our temptations and he knows the things that we've gone through and because of that he says I have a gift for you and it's the gift of grace some of us come from families where that's maybe that's not so much of an issue but what I have found is most of us even as Christians even as spirit-filled Christians we deal with a lot of issues because of how we've been brought up um, maybe because of the jobs that we've been part of for a long time. And a lot of us have worked hard. We've had, we felt like I've got to, uh, I've got to work to please my parents. I've got to re meet a certain standard or else I won't be accepted. If I don't do this, I'll be criticized. If I'm not this way, I'll be judged. And a lot of people are like that. But your Heavenly Father is not like that. And your Heavenly Father instead says to you, he gets down on one knee, so he gets down at your level. That's how I see it. He gets down on his knees and he opens his arms. That's the picture of the father and the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son was stinky, dirty, nasty. He'd been in the pig pen. He'd really blown it. I mean, he'd really blown it. He was so bad, so bad. And the father sees him coming a long way off and he starts running for him and he opens his arms wide and he hugs him in all of his dirt, in all of his stink, in all of his smell. He opens his arms and embraces him. He doesn't let him stay stinky and dirty and smelly because he's his son. And so he cleans him up and he gives him something new. And that's what God does with us as well. And so Jesus says, come to me instead of running the other direction. I love this also, and I've talked about this before, but I want to remind you of this. In verse 16, it says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Notice that it's not a throne of judgment. It's not a throne of power. It's not a throne of holiness. It's not a throne of righteousness. It's a throne of grace. 
It's a throne of grace. And when we come to Him, we receive the grace that we need for our time of need, in any time of need. Now, some of you this morning would say, yes, but Pastor Jennifer, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't. But Jesus does. And I didn't write this. Jesus wrote this. Jesus inspired this. And some of you would say, yes, but you know what? That wasn't just a sin that I didn't mean to commit. I meant to do it, and I did it. Jesus knows that also. And we need help for that too. And so we come to his throne and we receive the help that we need. And we come honestly. So what I want to say to you this morning is this. If you're thinking of making some New Year's resolutions, may I suggest to you that a good one you can make, it's going to be one that I make for 2020, is this. Every single morning, I am going to go to the throne of grace. And I'm going to say, Oh, Jesus, help me. I need your grace today. I need your grace today. And Jesus knows that we need his grace. And that's why he says, come to me. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you in every, every area. It may be a sin. It may be a weakness or a shortcoming. It may be something that you are bent in a certain way because of your family, how you were brought up. All of us, nobody has perfect parents here. I didn't. You say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, mom and dad. And they weren't perfect. They weren't perfect. Nobody has perfect parents. And all of us are affected in some way by that. And we're not perfect parents to our children either. But we all have a perfect father and it's God. It's God. And we can come and receive his gift of grace. So every day in 2020, I plan to say, oh, Jesus, I need your gift of grace today because it's the gift that I need. And I told you we were going to talk about a New Testament character and an Old Testament character. So let's look at the New Testament character first since we're right here. Okay. And the one I want us to talk about is uh, Paul just very quickly this morning. Um, Paul. Uh, and I want to look from 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. If you haven't read it recently, I encourage you, go back and uh, read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and you will find that Paul had a really complicated relationship with this church. He started the church. He poured his heart into the church. He loved the church, and they sort of loved him, and they sort of didn't. Um, it's a church, when he talks about it, he says, hey, I love you, don't you love me? Um, he's a church that he says, hey, some of you have said this, 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 and this. He said, come on, we all belong to Jesus. This is a church that said about Paul, let me, let me show you. Uh, Paul is quoting what he has heard that they've said about him. Very, very painful. It says, Paul's writing to them in 2 Corinthians, and he says, this is what the people were saying about him. His letters are weighty and powerful. We all know Paul was a great letter writer. Yeah? New Testament. So much of the New Testament. But his physical presence is weak, and his public speaking is despicable. Now, I don't know about you. If I heard those words, it hurt. It hurt. What are they saying? They're saying basically, um, just write letters to us. Don't come visit. Don't come visit us. Because when you come to visit us, really, Paul, you're a disappointment. You're not very good looking, and you're a bad public speaker. I'll be really honest with you. I sometimes look at Christian programming. As some of you are from Singapore, I am so sorry. I'm going to have to say something, but I'm not going to say the name. I sometimes see some speakers, not just the Singapore, U.S. Australia, everywhere. These men and women, I'm telling you, they look like superstars. So I'm serious. Superstars. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm impressed. And then I look at myself in the mirror and I think, hmm, hmm. Well, that's what they're saying about Paul. Paul, you're not very impressive. So I don't know. Maybe Paul was short and and. I don't know. Maybe he was super skinny or maybe he wasn't skinny at all. Maybe he was losing or had lost all of his hair. Maybe his, I don't know. We don't know. But apparently there was something that they said about Paul. You are physically unimpressive. And not only that, you're a bad public speaker. Now, what do you do? What's Paul going to do with this criticism? Because it's really painful. It's really hurtful. Remember, this is the church that he started, and he really loves them. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because we all get fingers pointed at us too, don't we? All of us do. 
What's the solution and what's the answer? Well, Paul can tell us what the answer is because Paul says, basically, you're right. I'm weak and I'm imperfect. You're right. I, I, I'm not great. Look at what he says. He says, when I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use eloquence and impressive wisdom to tell you the testimony about God because I decided I was going to forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. Look with me at verse 3. He says, I came to you in weakness, timid, with much trembling, and my message and my preaching, they were very, very plain. Now, brothers and sisters, there was nobody in the New Testament smarter than Paul, more educated than Paul, more intelligent than Paul, except for Jesus Christ, except for Jesus Christ, and yet Paul acknowledges his weakness. Paul acknowledges his weakness. Instead of trying to cover it up, instead of trying to hide it, Paul says, you're right. And besides, what are you going to do about the way you look? You know, you're going to go to the plastic surgeon? I'm going to use my money for other things. There are a lot of things that we can do very little about. Most of these things, the only thing we can do is rely on grace and call on grace. It, it really is. The only thing we can do is to get the grace of God. And Paul tells us this. Look with me, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. He acknowledges that the Lord allowed him to have a weakness. This was probably a physical weakness, and this was probably something to do with his eyes. We don't know, it, and it was an eye problem. I've preached about this before. It was some sort of eye problem that God did not heal. And I wonder about this also because it was some sort of eye problem. Remember, Paul is writing letters. Well, if you're writing letters, you need your eyes, don't you? You need to be able to see. If you're speaking publicly, you need, you, you need to be, it helps to see people clearly. And yet God allowed him to have this infirmity and God said, I'm not going to get rid of it either. And Paul begs God, Paul begs God, oh God, please, please make it go away. This is the blessing I want from you. I want you to heal me. And what does God say? He says, my grace is all you need. My grace is sufficient for you. And what I want to say to you this morning is this. The things that we're facing, the weaknesses that we have, now, if it's sin, we bring it to God, and God works on us, and He works on our character. But may I say to you this morning, there are some things in our lives and some weaknesses God is not going to change. He's not going to change. And He's going to say instead, I give you grace. God, I don't want grace. I want this instead. In effect, God is saying, nope, you need socks. I'm giving you socks. That, that's kind of the, the human example. God says you need grace. Grace is what you need for this situation and this circumstance. Our weaknesses have a greater potential to show God's glory than our strength, than our strengths do. They really do. I was listening some time ago to uh, a message and I heard uh, the pastor said something. I thought it's such a good example. I wanted to share it with you this morning as I, since I'm talking about grace. And he said, uh, the, this, this pastor said, I have a theory. It's called the magic wand theory. How many of you have ever wished you had a magic wand? Woohoo! And you could wave it and change something. You could change anything. You could change anything about you. Would you do it? I would. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Here's a magic wand. Change your finances. Change your character. Change your situation. Change your relationships. And this is what this pastor said. He said, I suspect if all of us had a magic wand and we changed something about us, we would never need God again. There are things in our lives that pull us, that push us to Jesus. We just, we're not good enough. We're not strong enough. We're not wise enough. We're not gifted enough. We're not intelligent enough. And Paul came to the place where he realized, God, I want this, but instead, you're giving me the gift I need, which is grace. And so Paul took 
the grace of God as the gift that he needed. Now very quickly, let me give you one more uh, example, because I told you I was going to give you one more example. And this comes from the Old Testament, and it's the story of Moses. And we all know the story of Moses. Um, so Moses is out in the middle of the wilderness, and he's taking care of sheep. He's already run away from Egypt. He's a shepherd, and he's out there taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. Okay, keep your, here we go. We know the story, okay? So you might have to turn to your own Bible right now, okay? So it's in Exodus chapter 3, okay? It'll come on in just a minute. Don't worry about it. Let's keep going, okay? Um, so he's out in the wilderness, and he sees a bush that's burning. Uh, by the way, our, our looking at it and whatever won't make that work any faster, so just that's okay. And he sees this bush that's burning and he goes and he looks at the bush that's burning and suddenly God speaks to him out of the burning bush. Now listen with me, Exodus chapter 3. So if you've got it in your Bibles, you can look. If you don't, just listen and uh, then it'll come back up in just a minute. Listen with me. The Lord said, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. Yay! Praise the Lord! God's going to deliver his people, right? God says, I have come down and I'm going to lead them out. This is wonderful. Verse 10. So now, Moses, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Praise the, uh, uh, what did you say, Lord? What did you say? I thought you were going to lead the people out of, you were going to lead the people out of Egypt. You want me to lead the people out of Egypt? Now, brothers and sisters, here's the point this morning, especially as we look ahead to 2020. Okay, let me back up just a minute. There we go. Here we go. Okay. So he says, I've come, I'm going to rescue them. Uh, and then he says to Moses, so you now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Here's the point, brothers and sisters, especially as we go into 2020. God has plans for 2020. There are things that God wants to do in 2020. There are big things and little things that God wants to do in this new year that comes up. So listen carefully. God has these plans, but God uses people to fulfill his plans, right? He uses people. God wants to use you to fulfill his plans. And God has plans big and small that will not happen unless you say, okay, yes, I'll do it. You and I say, okay, God, praise the Lord. You are going to blah, 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 blah. And God says, now, Mariange, now, Esperanza, now, Chris, now, Kim, go and do this. What? What? Now, I want us to see how grace works in such a situation like that. Because, brothers and sisters, if we will get our fingers out of our ears, God's going to speak to us, and there's some things He's going to want us to do. And it's His plans, but He's going to use us. And so, God says, okay, Moses, you go. And here is the reply. But Moses, by the way, if you go back and read Exodus 3 and 4, guess what? Moses five times, actually four times, Moses gives excuses. And the fifth time, he just says, no, I don't want to go get somebody else. It's not even an excuse. He just says, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. So he gives four excuses. And look at the last excuse. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord. I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. Moses was not making this up, by the way. If you look at other translations, Moses basically is saying, See, God, as we've been talking together, you could tell I don't speak very well. I don't know, maybe it was 40 years in the desert with sheep. You know, maybe that messed up, maybe that had a lasting influence on him. Now, I want to ask you something this morning. We're talking about grace. We're coming to, we're coming near the end, coming to the conclusion. Don't you think 
If God is going to get somebody to lead his people out of Egypt, he's going to have to speak to Pharaoh and all the, the most powerful man, the most powerful ruler on earth, along with all of his lawyers and his court magicians and all of these other people. Don't you think that God would choose somebody who's a good speaker to do that? Don't you think so? That's what I would think. Uh, God, you need to get somebody else, not me. I'm not very good. Look, lis listen, Lord. I don't know. Maybe Moses had a stutter or something like that. We, we don't really know. That might be what it means. What does God answer to Moses? Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? And I don't know how God says it, but I think God, I think God said it like this. Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Basically, God says to Moses, you think I'm making a mistake by asking you? Now, brothers and sisters, we're kind of laughing, but we're the same way, aren't we? Because sometimes God says, I want you to whatever. No, 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 no. No, Lord, hang on. Let me call the pastors. This is what they should do. Oh, somebody just pointed at Christy. Jean just pointed, and Christy just pointed at Jean. I don't know what's going on over there. But so often when the Lord calls us to do something, we look only at what we are not. We look only at our limitations. We look only at our inadequacies. We look only at our weaknesses. And we say, I can't do it. We look only at our own resources. I don't have the money to do it. I don't have the background to do it. I don't have the training to do it. And God, and, and basically what we're saying to God is, God, you got it wrong. So let somebody else go. And what God says to us this morning is, who do you think I am? Basically, right? Who do you think I am? Who gave a person his mouth? Who gave a person his mouth? He says, didn't I do it? Didn't I do it? Is it not I, the Lord? Verse 12, now go. I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Do you see grace in this verse this morning? Do you see grace? Where is it? I will help you speak and I'll teach you what to say. Brothers and sisters, you would think that when God was going to do something and he was going to have the gospel spread and the New Testament churches established, he could have chosen somebody more qualified than Paul, who wasn't very impressive looking and apparently was not a good public speaker, apparently. You would think that when he was calling somebody to speak to Pharaoh and lead his people out of Egypt, they could have chosen somebody more qualified, right? God doesn't make a mistake. God calls us and God gives us the gift we need and it's the gift of grace. It's the gift of grace. If we look at only what we cannot do, if we look only at what we cannot have, what we don't have, if we look only at what is not in our pocketbooks and not in our bank accounts, we'll never be able to do the work that God calls us to do. You see, and there are also some things that God wants to do in your life. And you may be thinking, Lord, that's impossible. I've been this way too long. God, I can't change. I've tried. Well, you're right. You can't change. You've tried. And the time has come to go to the throne of grace where Jesus is kneeling. He gets off the throne, by the way, and he kneels. And he holds his arms out and he says, let me help you. Let me give you the gift that you need. And so as we come to a conclusion this morning, Chris is going to come and lead us in one more song in just a minute. But I want to pray for you this morning. And I want you just to say, okay, well, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me this morning? Um, I, I know that he wants us to receive the gift that we need. And I know that he wants us to receive the perfect gift. And the perfect gift is the gift of grace. Your weakness, your inability, your need is matched perfectly by God's grace. It's a perfect match. It's a perfect match. Get your eyes off people and what people say about you and what you can't do and your shortcomings and instead look to Jesus who knows all of these things and understands all of these things and doesn't judge 
and he doesn't condemn. And he just says, come to me and I'll give you the gift that you need. And it's the gift of grace. And then as you look back at 2019, dearly beloved, let the Lord take your regrets from 2019. And we all have them, don't we? We all have them. Let the Lord take your regrets and say, okay, give them to me. And I'm going to give you grace for these things. And I'm going to wipe it clean. We're going to keep on going into 2020. And I'm going to give you grace for this new year. I'm going to work in your life. I'm going to work through you. And in the areas where you are weak, I may strengthen you or I may let you remain weak so that you will lean on me and depend on me to do the work that I want you to do. It's in God's hands. See, He's the one that gives us the gift. We don't decide what gift it is. He's the one that gives. So let's just take a moment and pray. I'm going to pray for you. And would you talk to the Holy Spirit this, this morning? And then Chris is going to come and lead us in worship. Chris, you can just come on up this morning. Lord, we come to you this morning. And God, we thank you. God, I thank you that you give us the gift that we need. Lord, I don't qualify. I try. Lord, I try to perform sometimes. But Lord, that's not the answer either. Your grace is the answer. Your grace is the answer for my inherent weaknesses. Your grace is the answer for my infirmities. Your grace is the answer for my iniquities and my sins. Lord, your grace is the answer for my inabilities. Your grace is the answer. Lord, help me to listen to your voice that tells me you give me your gift of grace and to close my ears to the voice of the enemy that continues to accuse and condemn because I'm not good enough. Lord, I know that. And you know that, and that's why you give me grace. Lord, I'm weak. I know that, and you know that, and that's why you give me grace. Lord, I've blown it, and I fall short. I know that. Lord, you know that. That's why you give me grace. Lord, I'm afraid of what people will say when I don't do it just right or get it just right. I, I know that. Lord, you know that, and that's why you give me grace, which covers that. And you let me know that I don't have to perform for you. I don't have to be good for you. I need your grace, and your grace is what will make a difference in my life. Lord, I pray for each one of us this morning. May we leave 2019 behind and just give you the regrets and say, okay, God, I, I didn't handle it right. It, it didn't work out right, but Lord, you're not condemning your grace and your love covers that. And Lord, as I go into 2020, I open my hands to receive the gift of grace that you give me. I am not going to run from you. I'm not going to hide. I'm not going to blame or excuse. I'm going to say, yes, Lord. It is I, and I'm going to come to you and receive the gift that I need, the gift of grace for every day. Lord, I don't want to be overcome in 2020. I want to overcome in 2020. And Lord, I know that I will by your grace, with your grace, through your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? We're going to worship the Lord.